Okay, great. Well, uh, I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Linda McGlone, and I work for the Monterey County Health Department, and I'm the coordinator of STRIVE, which is a demonstration project funded by the CDC to prevent youth violence. I also want to introduce my co-pilot and uh, technical guru here, Elizabeth Ruano. Hi, everyone. And she also works for the health department, and her assistance with these webinars is invaluable. Just a word about today's format. I have muted the audience except for our preventers, um, and that way it blocks out a lot of background noise, and if someone gets bored and puts the music on, we won't hear the music and know that you're bored. Um, so um, the way we found it works best is to type your questions uh, into the chat box um, or your comments into that portion of the screen. And our presenters will watch that section um, and they may comment immediately, but if not, I'll read the questions at the end of the presentation. We'll devote the last 15 minutes to uh, questions. And Again, if you uh, have a coworker, oh, we're getting closer. We've got about 30 folks um, who are participating, and we still have about five who have not uh, dialed in to hear the audio. So if you have a coworker who's going, where in the world is the audio, tell them they need to dial the number that we have in the chat screen. Okay. So to get us started, let's see who's here today, and I'll ask I'll ask you to go ahead and respond to the poll, uh, which asks, what kind of agency or organization do you represent this training? Go ahead and mark that. Good, thank you. And we've got a lot of nonprofit folks. Public health, ooh, public health taking the lead. And Mark, what kind of agency you represent today? We've got some folks from the city government, county government, a uh, few more folks could take the poll if they like, and then we will show you the results. There's a lot of public health folks today. That's great. That's great. And 23. I'll show you what we've got so far. So, public health, nonprofits. City, county government, a college and university representation, that's great. And there's another boat. And if that's about it, then I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and get started. Thank you very much for participating in that. That gives our presenters a sense of who's on the line. Uh-oh, nonprofits coming up. <laughs> coming up on the left. It's the nonprofit. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to close that and we'll get started. Today's webinar is entitled Building a, um, Children's Exposure to Violence Public Awareness Campaign, and we're going to learn about some of the lessons uh, learned from Chicago's Safe Start work. We're really lucky to have two such wonderful presenters today. So um, with that, I'd like to introduce our presenters. And our first presenter, um, although I think they're going to go back and forth, is Marlita White. Marlita earned her bachelor's and master's degree in social work from Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa, and the University of Illinois at Urbana. Go Fighting Illini. That's my alma mater. And for 10 years, Mrs. White, uh, Ms. White provided and supervised home-based clinical services to children at risk, uh, uh, out of home placement for psychiatric and other reasons, and their family. She's led national accreditation and program development teams for community-centered mental health and child welfare programs. Since 1996, Ms. White has been actively involved in research, strategic planning, and program implementation for various violence prevention initiatives. 
She worked as the Community Development Coordinator with the Chicago Project for Violence Prevention and is a research assistant at and as a research assistant at the University of Illinois Institute for Juvenile Research. In her current roles as director for the Chicago Department of Public Health, Office of Violence Prevention, project director for Chicago Safe Start Program, she's a frequent presenter on topics related to violence prevention and childhood exposure to violence. She's participated in the development of written and video-based training products and broad-based public awareness campaigns. She's a member of many boards, planning committees, action teams working on violence prevention and or community health and safety. Her research interests include faith-based institutional involvement in violence prevention and the impact of the built environment on violence. Ms. White has been honored by the Federal Executive Employee Board of Chicago. She received the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Fellowship at the University of Illinois. Chicago and the Outstanding Dedication to Children Award from the National Center for Children Exposure to Vi Child Exposure to Violence. In May of 2012, Ms. White received a Community Service Award from Urban Sustain Chicago. Welcome, Marlita. Hi, thank you. Good. If you could talk up just a little bit, we want to hear everything you've got to say. Now I'm going to introduce Ann Perry, our other um, presenter today. Uh, Ann is a recent transplant from Chicago, Illinois, uh, and served from 2001 to 2011 as an administrator for the Chicago Department of Public Health, directing the Office of Violence Prevention. Now an Orlando resident, that's Orlando, Florida, she is principal of AP Consulting, specializing in violence prevention training. Perry worked, Ms. Perry worked for 32 years with and on behalf of Chicago children and their families in a variety of capacities from domestic violence, shelter director, to violence prevention specialist, to executive director. She developed the nationally acclaimed prevention education program, Choosing Nonviolence, and authored three violence prevention books. She is the co-author of the curriculum, Bringing the Kids Back into Focus, a Chicago safe Start program product addressing young children's exposure to violence. Anne is also the developer of the violence prevention campaign concept known as Take 10, Talk It Out, Walk It Out, Wait It Out, which exemplifies the creative and innovative approach she takes in her dedication to the safety and well-being of children and families. Named as one of today's Chicago Women's 100 Women Making a Difference, Perry is also a past recipient of the Mayor Richard M. Daly Local Hero Award, the Rainbow House Individual Courage Award, the Chicago Safe Start Cutting Edge Award, and the Thousand Waves Peacemaker Award. So with that, I'd like to turn the program over to our two presenters, and Anne and Marlita, go ahead and you can advance to the, your first slide. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me just make sure that uh, you all can hear me fine. So, Linda, you tell me yes or no? You could speak up just a little bit, Marlita. Okay. I am very soft-spoken, <laughs> as no one ever says. So um, I want to walk us through um, the objectives for the time we're going to spend. We do have a lot to say in a short amount of time, but Ann and I have tried to lift up the most important elements for the discussion. I do want to let you know that we will send at the end of the webinar an evaluation, and we do encourage you to give us feedback. We certainly value that. For this uh, next hour or approaching an hour, we're going to make sure that you have a sense of the overall work that Chicago Safe Start was called to do. I um, want to also highlight some key components of our um, in terms of Chicago Safe Start's public awareness campaigns and because we've done several. And then also we want to review as we go through the discussion several lessons that we learned and, and also we will weave in recommendations for future efforts. So to begin with Chicago Safe Start, it is an initiative that was initially funded by the Department of Justice in 2000. We were the first wave of Safe Start programs in the initial seven, I'm sorry, 11 programs that were funded. 
And we have been really working since that time on exposure to violence. We went into full implementation in 2002, and um, the funding ended in 2007. And we've managed to maintain and sustain our work um, through other commitments, including the department, um, the Chicago Department of Public Health, as kind of our uh, continuing seat for our staff and our programs. The goals for Chicago Safe Start really uh, continue to be what we started out with. We were to raise public awareness around child exposure to violence. We anticipated that some people knew a lot about it, but a lot of people didn't know much about it at all. Uh, that we would convene a board of stakeholders. Uh, for us, it is our implementation advisory board. Uh, and then we would, be, uh, we would set in place uh, mechanisms so that we could demonstrate the effectiveness of clinical support for uh, children who have been exposed to violence with a focus on their early child. Um, so we're talking about zero to five years of age. And then we would seek opportunities at the end of the day. We want to change systems. And so all of the partnerships, all of the um, different kinds of work that we did, we really wanted to put that in the hands of decision makers and really try to facilitate and encourage other systems to make adjustments in the way they do business with um, better awareness of how children are affected by exposure and what prevention looks like. So I think what we'd like to do now is to ask you once again to um, respond to this poll and give us a sense of where your coalition or your program is in your efforts to raise awareness around child exposure to violence. And we'll give you about two minutes to respond. Thank you. Yeah, please go ahead and take the poll. We still have a couple of folks um, who were helping um, connect with the audio. Um, and we've put the call-in number again in the chat box. So take the poll. So it looks like, Marlita, you've got some folks that have initiated a campaign that have begun and have maybe started to put the pieces in place of a campaign. That's great. So we should probably close this in about um, 45 seconds. So go ahead and keep voting. Sounds good, whatever you like. We actually are pleased to have about 42 participants today on the call. So we'd love to hear from a few more folks as to what, um, what sort of experience you've had in uh, your coalition, your program, in trying to raise awareness of uh, children's exposure to violence. So it looks like we're holding at 28. Should we go ahead and display the results? Sure. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to hold on I need to display the results. Get the results. There we go. Looks like folks have some experience with uh, um, an awareness campaign for CEV, Marla, uh, Marlita. Great. And so really what we tried to do is to balance the conversation. So for some of you, um, this may be confirming for some of your work, and for others, we hope that this will save you some time. Um, let's go ahead then and uh, invite Ann into the conversation to take us through lesson one. Well, hi, everybody. I'm really glad um, to be part of this uh, to tell our story of our experience in, in building um, what I think uh, needs to be a, a long-term, passionate commitment to uh, creating environments where our youngest children are safe uh, and where trauma is reduced uh, or eliminated. 
Um, I did want to say that the Chicago Safe Start grant was a demonstration grant from the Department of Justice, and uh, I inherited it as uh, the former director of the Office of Violence Prevention. And what I learned very quickly was that it demanded every ounce of uh, energy and creativity and passion that we could muster, uh, and it was not hard to do because one of my first lessons learned is that in every group of people, there will always be some champions of very young children, zero to five. It may be a mayor who has young children. It could be a foundation CEO who uh, had an experience with violence as a youth. So uh, my first lesson, our first lesson, was you can't do it alone, nor should you do it alone, and that the success of any public awareness campaign uh, depends on involving as many different folks, people who uh, perhaps stretch us, people who are the unlikely suspects in building um, a public awareness campaign around childhood exposure to violence. Uh, in Chicago Safe Start, we had um, already, the, the Public Health Department had already convened a project called Prevent Violent Chicago, which had called together, as only a health department can do as a neutral Switzerland of, of city stakeholders, uh, we called together hundreds of stakeholders to develop a comprehensive response plan uh, for violence prevention. And happily, the Chicago Safe Start project was a spin-out from uh, that effort. And we had um, an executive team for Prevent Violence Chicago, a very high-level uh, uh, participants, um, graphic, uh, a graphics firm specializing in health policies, uh, leadership from a civic community like Metropolis, um, statewide violence prevention folks, community activists, uh, representatives from early childhood, child welfare, the police department, uh, the domestic violence community, and of course our own uh, public health uh, department, as well as some delegate agencies and service providers, service partners within Chicago Safe Start. So uh, we convened um, a public awareness work team for Chicago Safe Start that actually was the executive team of Prevent Violence Chicago. They just segued over to become the public awareness work team uh, for uh, Safe Start. Um, we always uh, tried to maintain an openness for additions to the work team. People come, people go. Um, variety of ideas and opinions. Uh, sometimes we didn't always agree, uh, but tension was not uh, seen as a negative. Uh, but it helped, I think, overall develop a better project. Um, I think one of our lessons learned was that we do need to look, however, for balance in, in a work team so that we can uh, move ahead. I just also want to point out that over the years, Chicago Safe Start, um, it was very important for us to have our own house, the Chicago Department of Public Health, to buy in and, and be champions with us. And, uh, and that led to some credibility and integrity. Uh, Chicago Safe Start has survived, if you will. Um, five commissioners uh, within uh, the leadership of the health department, four police superintendents, three D uh, Department of Children and Family Services directors, and four school uh, superintendents. So I think it's really important to have a long-term look as to how we can institutionalize some of the great work that we do around public awareness. Um, Marlita, did you want to add anything there? No. Okay. So uh, our lesson number two is uh, that we needed to get focused. Um, we had many, many talented people with many creative ideas, but we had to come up with a plan. And so it was very important for us as a team to articulate our goals and to come up with a, some key messages and common language 
uh, that was really, uh, I don't even know that we knew at that time how important that was. Um, but in order to saturate a community with a message, uh, they need to hear the same words over and over again. We were very influenced by the story that got Safe Start going in the first place. And we heard it and were very touched by it that there were police officers who routinely responded to domestic violence calls. And when they would go in the house, their primary role would be to uh, address the offending and non-offending adults. But more often than not, officers would notice on the couch two, sometimes three, little babies, toddlers, just sitting on the couch, wide-eyed, deer-in-the-headlights look, taking all of what was going on around them in. And one enlightened police officer said, what about these kids on the couch? Who's, who's doing anything for them? Is anybody noticing the kids on the couch? Because if we don't do something for the kids on the couch, they are going to be the very ones we respond to uh, 15 years from now. So uh, I guess one of my recommendations as a human being is that I think it's important to know our stories and to use our stories to help um, raise awareness in, in a, a non-threatening kind of way. One of our public, health, uh, public awareness team members was always, she was a, a vice president of a very established or a civic organization in Chicago, and she kept saying, we need to get to legislators. If we're going to change policy, we need to get to the legislators. Legislators like one-pagers with a story, a human interest story that they can connect to. And so uh, we, in reaching agreement on our own public awareness goals and messages, was really, uh, really important. And the other thing we needed to do was know who our primary priority audiences would be, and then to figure out what did we know about the audience's knowledge of, of childhood exposure to violence, and we wanted people's behavior to ultimately change. That was the goal of our public awareness um, efforts. And so um, we needed to figure out how best uh, we could um, assist people in understanding and responding, uh, and as well as preventing childhood exposure to violence. OK, Marlita? Um, I do want to add that. Uh, one thing that was also important, uh, I think maybe important to mention now, is that uh, Safe Start had a number of committees that were operating at the same time. And those committees had to do a lot of crosstalk. So our public awareness committee was kind of our brain in terms of developing those um, initial uh, messages and what our elevator speech would be. But then we would oftentimes go back and forth to our direct service committee partners and find out, does this make sense for them? Or our first responder committee, which was in charge of really trying to manage and orchestrate our interactions with the police department, the fire department, um, and other entities that respond in crisis situations. We wanted to make sure that we understood that community's um, point of access to young children who might be in those situations and, and what they needed, what they needed in terms of materials, where their learning curve, um, how that uh, curve existed. And so I think that crosstalk between those committees, um, making sure that that's in place is also important. So let's move to our third lesson, and that has to do with branding. We really learned, um, we kind of went to school on branding. Um, we relied um, very heavily on our social marketing partner, uh, PSNA, um, because they, as Ann mentioned, they have this um, expertise in um, health um, policy and really speaking in different and very impactful ways to the health community in segments, the physicians to nurses, nursing uh, staff to insurers and so forth. And so we found that we really had to understand branding and, and what was the Safe Start brand. How did we develop that, that brand and, and what we were going to do over time to really nurse and um, 
preserve the integrity of that brand. And so um, the steps that we went through, um, some of what we did is kind of shortcut that for you. So we had a lot of development conversations what the graphic needs to look like, what the tagline needs to look like. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about taglines and some of the risks um, with getting it right and getting it wrong, risk and benefits. But um, I think for this piece of the discussion, we spent lots of time developing ideas and materials. We always went just kind of as a template into a testing phase. Um, so what we would do is um, – work with, again, our direct service partners and some of our other community partners um, far afield from downtown to make sure that we had access to different people who were going to use these materials, to parents, to daycare providers, to early educators, to police officers. And we wanted to put these materials in front of them, get their feedback, and make sure we came back to the drawing board and developed, again, uh, materials that would speak and resonate with that speak to and resonate with that particular audience. Then we went into full implementation with those various products, and always we had to do an evaluation about, you know, did we, um, were we successful in getting those materials out? And so, so we may be looking at our process, you know, that might need some corrections, but also did the materials speak in the way that we anticipated and what was our capacity to make those course corrections if the materials in some way um, landed in the wrong um, voice. Um, and you wanted to mention something also about um, this evaluation piece. Well, I believe that if we had it to do over again, uh, I would have really pushed harder even though Quite frankly, the dollars were not there. But I would have pushed harder for inclusion of public awareness efforts in the uh, comprehensive Safe Start evaluation, which really uh, pretty much only looked at um, direct service uh, numbers. Uh, but I think public awareness is such a critical uh, question, how do we know that we've saturated the community with uh, the right kind of messages uh, that will position people to make uh, the necessary changes in communities and in families? Right. So what we did was include for your, just kind of to give you a touch point for this part of the conversation. We included a couple of posters so that you can take a look at on the top of the screen. This is actually uh, one of the earlier posters we had um, uh, that we implemented. We had initially a poster that talked about bringing the kids back into focus. You'll get a chance to look at what that graphic felt, looks like a little later. But this one poster here is available in English and Spanish. It's 95 ways to make a difference in the life of a child who's been exposed to violence. And all of the 95 ways speaking to parents and caregivers are free, things that aren't really, you know, they're not expensive in time. Um, um, they're not um, difficult to do. We also, you will see um, a banner that we use in the Pedway exhibit that we had um, in the lower level in Chicago. We have a Pedway that rests under a lot of our um, kind of the commercial stores downtown and as well as some office buildings and city buildings. And so there's a lot of traffic, foot traffic going through there. And so we had an opportunity to have these varying Pedway exhibits for many, many years. Um, we have um, a newsletter that we're showing you here because the department, the Department of Health has a healthy Chicago policy agenda that it actually initiated, I want to say, at the end of 2011. And we were able to include in this policy agenda um, violence was selected as one of the 12 important health areas that the, the city would focus on improving, and then child exposure to violence is included in that um, set of strategies um, around violence. We also include um, a snapshot of our website um, that we've spent many, many years, lots of hours working on developing and redeveloping. This is probably the fourth version of our website. So over these last 10 to 12 years, we've been um, um, 
in a constant developmental um, stage with the website. It's very important, as everyone knows, um, and, and it's very expensive, or it can be. So there is an important piece with developing a website to get it right, uh, or at least right for the moment, but then try to build in some future utilities into the site. So one thing that we did as we went to this last stage of the website was that we uh, built this version so that we had content management um, access because we knew that we couldn't afford to have a web designer continue to support the site. So our staff were able to do that. And then the last piece is our training collaborative. Um, worked with us, another one of Safe Starks committees, to develop bringing the kids back into focus, which is um, our curriculum, focusing on building a community response to child exposure to violence. Um, and this curriculum carries the same tagline that, the, that Safe Start uses often, which is bringing the kids back into focus. Um, use some of our um, photo work in, in and throughout the curriculum. But um, it is a product that we, you know, constantly also refresh and re-release uh, to the public and use and keep in use with um, our our partners. You know, Marlita, I would also like to add in that there were many other products, tchotchkes that we developed. That I think you can tell by now, blue and green are the Safe Start colors. Um, we also have the Safe Start Kids, which was um, our own original uh, photo op with community children um, early on. And so you see a lot of Chicago uh, Safe Start Kids pictures, faces uh, on most of our uh, materials. But there were other tchotchkes that we developed that I think were very important and could be distributed widely, like bibs, growth charts, uh, mirrors, Band-Aid packets, pens. And I believe our balloons went a long way. We had green and blue balloons hanging in the most unlikely places. And many people's eyes would go, oh, that must be safe start. Safe starts here. So that's all part of the branding and the, the product development that was uh, very tightly coordinated in some ways and really um, very loose in other ways. But I just wanted to mention the variety of other products that were um, uh, built or, or produced um, throughout the years. So our next lesson learned is uh, the need to speak to your audience. Um, we developed um, many, many strategies involving um, our priority audiences who we identified as early care and education providers, teachers, parents, and um, some systems partners like police um, and Department of Children and Family Service uh, workers. Um, so we adapted some of the, um, the products that we had made and uh, adapted the content of them, whether it's in a brochure where we took our original brochure and adapted it somewhat for parents and then adapted it in another way for providers. Uh, we had uh, a POM. Uh, card that we developed specifically for police officers because they wanted something immediate that they could give to the non-offending parent um, or, or caregiver uh, that would get help for them for that child, zero to five, who had been exposed to something potentially traumatic. So um, we took great care to look at the materials and say, how could we tweak this? to speak to this audience. Um, it, it got to be somewhat expensive, as you can imagine, but um, I think at the end of the day, we believed uh, well worth um, the effort. And you can see the samples um, in that next slide there where the brochure. Again, you can see the Safe Start Kids. The palm card is to the right. And then we had a number um, well, more than a number of community events over the years 
uh, going from uh, a huge citywide parade ca called the Bud Billiken Parade um, to local community events, whether it was a healthy, uh, healthy kids, uh, healthy community fair, um, or a local sports event, or um, uh, so anyway, adapting those materials, those posters, those banners uh, to specific community events. Okay. So I did. Uh, I'm sorry, Marlita. Can I just? Sure. Um, I, I want to just uh, kind of reflect on a, an experience we had with the citywide Bud Billiken parade, and talk just for a second about the difference between um, a creative tagline and a direct tagline. We uh, had pushed the bringing the kids back into focus as our creative tagline. Um, during one of the Bud Billiken parades, we uh, had gotten word to one of the announcers, it was televised, uh, to highlight uh, bringing the kids back into focus and Chicago Safe Start. But uh, that year, this parade has thousands of floats and identifying banners, and uh, every group has an identifying banner. Well, we had the Safe Start banner, but we did not have the Chicago Department of Public Health banner. And so the people who were in front of us were Chicago Housing Authority, and when the television spokesperson saw bringing the kids back into focus, she said, yes, that's what Chicago Housing Authority needs to do, is bring the kids back into focus. Well, that is true, and in one way that we were very happy uh, about that, but we did not have a direct identifier uh, within that parade line that said, this is Chicago Safe Start, this is the Chicago Department of Public Health. So to think about that, how important is it to, um, to you and your efforts to be identified with the issue? Um, it's something to think about. And we consequently, subsequently, added a direct tagline under bringing the kids back into focus, helping children exposed to violence, because the connection was not automatic. Okay, Marlita. Great. Thanks, Anne. That's a good point. Um, and this actually segues nicely into our next lesson, which is to stay visible. Um, as you know, Chicago State Start has been working for more than a decade now, and we have really struggled and tried to be very creative in making plans to stay in front of our different audiences and to not just kind of disappear off to the side. And so what we would do with our public awareness team was to make annual plans to keep our um, to maintain our public presence. And so we have an example of what that plan looks like um, so that you can basically see what, obviously, an annual calendar, um, how that looks, but then to scan not only from your staff perspective but across your different teams so that you're hearing from different communities of practice, from your police partners, from your service partners, from your community outreach and engagement partners, what those big moments might be, either at a zip code level, working across different kinds of uh, ways you slice the city, the, the region or district or zip code or census tract or whatever that is. What's your plan to stay out in front of your, your audience? Um, and so we would um, set out at the beginning of the year to make sure that we were applying to various conferences across the year. We would make sure that we were going to uh, amass enough materials to distribute at a number of community fairs or health fairs or outreach campaigns. Um, and then we also started to do work on our own campaign that had to do with preventing exposure to violence um, for where we would focus for one week um, and try to bring others to our table. And so you can see here the um, Prevent Child Exposure to Violence Week, uh, which is the third week in April. Uh, we included um, a, the poster so that you can get a sense of how we've been advertising more, more lately. This has been um, our focus campaign for six years. 
And we have, for the first three years, to go back to what Ann mentioned, the first three years of the campaign, it was really about Chicago Safe Start awareness because we wanted people to know that we were present uh, and working across Chicago, not just in our demonstration districts. Um, but we started shifting from Chicago Safe Start to exposure to violence, and we lifted that issue up higher than the program itself because we wanted to be sure that regardless of the funding that's available for the program, that we were able to scaffold from the work we were doing in the health department to all of the different partners who really had a stake in this issue continuing to rest at the forefront of the public's um, focus. And so um, more recently we've used every person every day as our kind of operational tagline. Um, we, across this initiative, um, this observance, really focus heavily on collaboration with lots of partners to carry out the events every year. Um, we always have a central message, and as I said, our central message this year is every person every, um, every day or for the past three years. We always develop a set of materials that we try to distribute to all the city clinics, all the city libraries, all the city park districts, all the police districts, and then all of the other places we get partners who will help us post that material and put this information in the hands of families. Always a, a calendar of shared activities where we are showing up, where our partners are doing events, and then we have the concluding event on that Friday. And what you have here are just kind of pictures to give you a sense of the diversity of the events. We've done art exhibits with um, our interns where the art focused on exposure to violence scenarios. We've done lots of community gatherings where we bring partners together to celebrate, and there you have our uh, blue and green balloons yet again. Uh, we have one student, one of our interns in the past, um, was able to help us translate and deliver a child exposure to violence training during CEV Prevention Week to a Korean um, community resource center. And then we have always try to have some kind of public display. And you have one where we were displaying in the state building. And then here are just a few other pictures where we're working, some of our partners are doing kind of working with a folklore um, um, artist where he's doing direct engagement with young people. An example of some of the larger events where people um, with our partners in Inglewood, where they brought hundreds and hundreds of families together to have activities. And at the same time, they ran um, training sessions concurrent with the activities. And then that's just a picture of the Community Spirit Award, which is a, an award that we give out across different arenas, business, community service, police, um, direct practice, education, where we try to open up for nominations and then award people for really doing amazing work around child exposure to violence prevention. Um, and then just to conclude this piece, this um, shows you a couple of events that some of our North North Side Partners and Northwest Side Partners, CASA and Harlan, um, one event they did was an indoor sports fest. Um, and they, this is showing you some of the partners that got together to produce that event. And then the other is an art exhibit that, um, again, Harlan and CASA worked together, did a citywide call um, for young children starting, I believe, at three years old up to 18 to submit artwork um, that would represent their vision of peace in their community. And um, this uh, is one of the winning pieces by a young lady who's five years old. Okay. Um, there were just a couple of things I wanted to mention. Uh, one of our colleagues who was a service provider in one of the communities mentioned that she had a concern when young people were killed uh, in the neighborhood, there was this uh, ritual of setting up memorials with balloons and teddy bears and flowers. And she noticed that parents would very, very often bring their babies, their toddlers, uh, right up to the, the place where the ritual uh, was built. And she wondered if the parents 
said anything to the children, if they understood what really had happened there and why they were there. And uh, one of the very important um, aspects that we were so committed, that we still are so committed to, is the the education of parents about what their children see and what their children hear um, and what their their children experience. So um, I think that's really an important community experience to reflect on. How does something like Chicago Safe Start intersect with um, parents uh, of very young children. And in our public awareness efforts, going back to that very first slide where we can't do it alone, um, what we did do was strategically uh, provide information and materials to those um, highways to accessing parents. We would speak at, at parent conferences, and if an agency called us, we, we could, uh, as far as our capacity allowed, go and actually conduct a, a parent group around childhood exposure to violence. But I think more importantly, the, the training team intersected with public awareness, and we committed to training uh, other community members to process this exceedingly um, uh, layered issue uh, with with parents, either one on one or in groups. Another reason why we targeted daycare home providers um, because they have children in their homes uh, more often, more hours than they they spend in their own homes. So, um, other lessons that we learned from all of this, uh, these many years' experiences, um, to reflect on the use of spokespersons. Um, we need all kinds of champions on every level from every community and every institution. Um, and, but, you, but what we found was it's important to figure out when is it best to have somebody famous, to have somebody familiar. In, in one of our communities, um, a series of billboards went up um, with a message for young parents using young parents from the community. One of the neighborhood banks uh, did a billboard series using the very young people in the community. And that had a very interesting effect on the community. When do you use celebrities? Um, when and how do you solicit uh, the support of a positive authority figure? Um, and then um, another lesson we learned was to focus on saturation strategies. I is it better to focus your energies and accomplish, yes, we're going to reach the 14,000 early care and education providers this year with materials, uh, with education and training, um, and with communication, um, or, you know, as we, we wanted the message to go everywhere to everyone uh, at the same time, and, and we had obvious capacity issues to do that. So really focusing on the priority audiences and then figuring out, well, how many of them are there? What are the avenues to access? And how do we saturate those avenues? Um, you know, where where do people go? Is it is it the beauty salons? Is it the food stores? Is it the health clinics? Is it the institutions of higher learning? Where do we put the materials? Where, you know, domestic violence community learned that bathrooms were a very effective place to put um, hotline information uh, for women who were being abused. So uh, focusing on those saturation strategies so that you optimize. Um, the very limited resources that you have. And this is Linda. I'm going to interrupt. We've got about nine minutes left. So I've asked folks if they have questions um, to please type them in the chat box. Uh, that's in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. You just type your question in uh, the blank box uh, that's uh, in the lower left corner, almost in the, in the corner itself and then hit send, and um, we'd like to uh, have that discussion. While we're waiting for uh, questions, 
Um, thank you for putting up, uh, Marlita has put up her contact information. And I would also like to recommend um, the Chicago Safe Start .net website. Um, you have a number of your materials uh, on your website. And I, I, how, how um, I know funding is limited. Um, are you able still to share some of those materials with folks who request them? Um, this is Marlita. I can respond. Um, at this point, we really have um, probably enough materials to make them available maybe like a, and as a sample. So we don't, and we never really did ever have 10 billion copies of anything. But we definitely um, posted those on the site because we want people to, you know, we want to save someone else some time. Um, but then if you'd like to see a version of it so that you can get a sense of the paperweight and all those kind of more specific details, we can certainly share that as well. Okay. I also want to point out that there is a National Safe Start uh, Center website with, uh, again, a, a lot of media resources um, from the other Safe Start sites throughout the country. Um, there's a real need, I think, not to reinvent the wheel and to use whatever materials uh, speak that might speak to your community. Um, so the National Safe Start Center dot org. Is that it, Marlita? Yeah. Looks like dot net. Dot net. Okay. Dot. Thank you, Linda. Good. Thank you very much. So we have a question here from Alberta, and he asks, um, "How did you develop your evaluation?" How do you evaluate an awareness campaign? Uh, and you can do that in <laughs> three minutes. I don't know how. Yeah, so here's our, this is our short version of that response. Yeah. Um, and this is um, something that Ann talks about a lot. Um, we, within Safe Start, there were de dedicated dollars um, to, um, to address evaluation. But the evaluation was really specific to the direct service piece. And so, you know, because the focus was on direct service outcomes. And um, so we were really left to figure out different ways to, within the confines and the um, capacities of our direct, of our public awareness group, to figure out how we were going to assess our success with public awareness outside of our direct budget for program evaluation on the direct service side of things. And so um, there is. I think lots of information available on the web and in other places um, in terms of ways that you can evaluate your success. But we actually, when we started developing our various campaigns and even the materials that supported the campaigns, we spent a lot of time researching how people um, within those various campaigns, for example, the Ad Council, how they talked about their success. And so a lot of times we would do, develop sentinel measures, so we didn't know how many um, you can deliver a thousand pieces of paper somewhere, but that doesn't always mean that a thousand people picked that information up and got it in their hands. So sometimes you wind up with a measure that is not the most perfect, most direct measure of how many people are walking and talking with that information in their hands or in their head, but then you come up with a way that you can understand and articulate to other people the, the volume of the work that you've done. So sometimes it's a process measure more so than an outcome measure. Okay, great. We're getting a number of questions. If you could highlight what were the outcomes of your campaign? Um, uh, much of our work really was supportive of other pieces of our work. So for example, we were raising awareness in, in, in lots of instances trying to help parents walk into the front door to ask for help. So we're looking at help seeking. And um, in other instances, we're trying to actually raise awareness within an organization so they change their practice. Um, we're working with the, um, the police department to change the way that officers interact um, with families at the point of contact when there's a violent event. Um, also trying to work with the police department to change the rules so that when they encounter a family that they not only say and do things differently, but that that is a part of the protocol and that they exchange a card, that they help the family make a phone call to a service helpline. So I think that we have varying outcomes and varying levels of success because, as Ann mentioned, we may have one um, 
real important and made, made important inroads in one organization, then the leadership changes, and a lot of times you start over. Yeah. You know, there was a young woman who called wanting to register for a domestic violence conference we were giving, and um, she asked if she could be, bring her 18-month-old baby. And we said, sure, if that's the only way you can come, we kind of hoped you could get child care that day and just have the day for yourself, but sure. And she said, I think I'm having trouble bonding with my baby. And the our our person at the other end said, why do you think you're having trouble? And she said, I think it has something to do with the fact that last year my baby and I witnessed the murder of, of my older daughter. Now, we talked with her about Chicago Safe Start and about how her, her relationship with her baby, how smart she was to know that something happened between her baby and her at that moment. Perhaps she shut down. She, perhaps she, you know, through depression, uh, she was just overcome and didn't meet the needs of the baby and whatever, whatever. But after telling her about Chicago Safe Start, she said, are they open right now? And so I think one of the outcomes that we hope for is that in giving voice to this issue of childhood exposure to violence at least every year, X number of times a year in every community, that uh, they will know that help is available, they are not alone, and that there are things we can do individually as well as communities. I think also in, in terms of outcomes that probably the most obvious one, and forgive me if it's too obvious, is that as an awareness campaign, you just wanted people to know that this is a problem. And what we're finding in our community is that folks don't know that when children are exposed to violence that there are real changes uh, in, in the brain development. So I'm sure that was something, am, am I correct that that was one of your major outcomes? Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, when uh, through one of the community colleges, we did a session with parents on brain development and how it is affected by exposure to violence. And we were very nervous that this would kind of be uh, an unreachable uh, topic. And it was the highlight of this organization's parent education program for the year. Parents are amazed at the impact on the brain. Um, and on future ability to learn and be a happy, productive individual. So we've got about one minute left. I can keep going. So um, if folks don't mind staying on the call for a few minutes more, I'd like to get to these at least these two last questions because these are important folks in our community. Um, Tito from Juntos Podemos asks, um, so how did you know you were successful? So um, this is Marlita, and I think I want to um, kind of dovetail with Anne. Um, oftentimes you can be working in a vacuum, and you won't know that you're being successful. But I think you have to do two things. One, your measures of success need to be reasonable. And so if the only way you're going to know you're successful is that, um, you know, 9,000 parents call the helpline, that's unreasonable. Um, so you have to have measures that are accessible to you. So, for example, periodically we might go into a community that we've been working in and we've been dis displaying materials, and you can go into that police district and ask people, have you seen this, this um, poster? Do you know about this program? So you can assess your success and, and the level of saturation that has occurred within your target audience by going back and asking those questions periodically. Um, also, over time, you know, as Ann said, we did the, um, that uh, poll that one group we were um, set to educate parents and early educators. But I do this work, for example, once a month. I'm training in the, in the jail with incarcerated mothers or, or mothers who are pregnant or either they've already delivered very young children or they are themselves pregnant at that moment. And so I'm able to always ask people, what do you know about exposure to violence? You know, we're constantly running into people who still don't know about this issue. So where we think we've had some measure of success, there is much, much, much more work to be done. And Chicago has the benefit of many other partners who are doing work alongside of us. We're not the only party doing this work. 
Um, and we work a lot with those other groups, the Childhood Trauma Coalition, as we mentioned, the National Safe Start Center, where um, someone mentioned or asked about Dr. Bruce Perry. He's working on a video campaign that we are a partner with the Childhood Trauma Coalition. Um, our uh, stories for children that grown-ups can watch, is, which is an animated um, um, video product. So there are lots of other partners who can help you do the work, but I think you have to work with those other partners to figure out how you measure that success. Good. It, it sounds like your campaign developed um, incredible synergy and, and working with a lot of different agencies who also sort of ran with the ball. Can, can you give us a rough idea, and Chicago is a much bigger city than Salinas, um, than our community is, but can you get us, give us a sense of how much you spent on print materials, um, uh, on publicity? And I suppose it sounds like you worked with a consultant as well. Um, well, our consultant was pro bono, so um, you have to find a person that has a good heart but also is intelligent about the issue. So we were definitely blessed to have that resource. Um, so some of the products and materials that we wound up developing didn't cost what might perhaps what it really cost. Um, and our budget varied. So maybe one year we might have a $25,000 budget, and another year we may have a $5,000 budget. Uh, and so depending on how much money you have, you have to find those resources that make sense. The important and, and I think a really positive aspect of a limited budget is that the closer you get to the community that you want to impact working at the zip code level, those um, connectors don't always cost a lot of money. And so we have access, for example, to social media with Twitter and Facebook and things like that. So you can get that message out that way. You can work with the, um, for us, our aldermen, that's at a smaller district, um, elected official. Um, you can work with your libraries and other resources where people are there anyway, and you're just running off copies and trying to put it in the hands um, of other people. You know, how do you reach your public? So I don't know that you always have to have the largest budget, and a large budget does not guarantee that you're going to be the most, have the greatest impact. Sounds good. Sounds good. We've got one more question. I'll take that. Um, folks are starting to sign off. And so if you sign off, if you have to leave, um, we ask that you answer the, evalu the evaluation questions uh, that you'll receive once you log off of the uh, webinar. So um, as all of us program folks know, we need that evaluation data um, for our funders. So. Be kind to uh, Marlita and Ann, uh, Marlita at the Public Health Department, and please take the three evaluation questions. It's super simple and, and will just be a second once you log off. So I'm going to take the final question now, which is from Lolita Hendricks, and she asks, um, what, what have been the greatest challenges in maintaining uh, a momentum for this work? Ann, do you want to jump in? Well, I think dedicated staff in an age when uh, we have uh, decrease in staffing, increase in responsibilities. Most people have two or three full-time jobs. Um, so dedication of staff is definitely uh, an ongoing challenge. Um, uh, I'll, I'll jump in. I think another challenge is really trying to keep that message out there. Because people are so distracted, and sometimes the shiny thing is what distracts people the most, and so you have to refresh your, your campaign. You've got to refresh your message. I think you just have to keep pushing. And if you have something like an annual calendar, that's going to keep your program on its toes to get back out in front, to be ready to show up at that conference, to show up at that health fair, or to generate that campaign, or to refresh the campaign. So I think you have to have some annual goals that keep you moving forward because you will run out of steam eventually because it can be frustrating with administration changes and starting over. I think you just have to find other ways in terms of creating a framework that keeps the program and the message uh, moving. It's also a challenge to um, institutionalize 
uh, CEV awareness and response within a variety of agencies, whether it's uh, um, re-entering the community after incarceration. I mean, there are so many agencies that have stepped up to the plate and in some shape or form institutionalized CEV awareness into whether it's their intake form or uh, discussion groups or, uh, you know, planning uh, parenting, education sessions, whatever. And I think to the extent that partners will uh, institutionalize it, it will continue. But it's, it's a great challenge because of uh, being overwhelmed by so many needs and having so few resources because prevention is always the one to get knocked to the corner when uh, there is a fiscal cliff tilt, crisis, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> I like that. Well, I want to thank everybody for their time and attention using Marlita's words. Um, I very much want to thank our speakers for sharing what they learned in um, creating uh, an awareness campaign in Chicago. Again, our speakers today were Marlita White of the Chicago Public Health Department and Ann Perry, formerly of the Chicago Department of Public Health and now a happy resident of Orlando, Florida. And I just wanted to mention that I think our coalition here in Salinas, uh, which is called CASP, is uh, very, very grateful for what we've heard today. And we are kind of thinking that we would like to join um, a national campaign in April if, if we could piggyback on some of your successes. We would welcome. Um, greater partnership across the country with um, other municipalities sharing the Prevent CV Week uh, campaign. Terrific, terrific. Well, thanks. We'll be in touch more on that later. Thanks to all of our participants. Take the evaluation if you would, and have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.